Good morning. How's everyone doing? I'm not going to lie. Um, that prayer time, like we didn't necessarily have that in our plan for this morning. And we were in our, going to our production meeting and it was like, you know, we should, we should pray. I feel like we should pray. And so we prayed. And it was, was it just me or was that the most necessary thing that we've had in a long time? Like I was so encouraged by that, honestly. And I think I know we all have our own prayer lives and whatnot, but something is there's something powerful about being like shoulder to shoulder with people that are also having needs and that are also praying and that are also calling upon the name of God. Like, there's just something about that. And so I don't know. I was encouraged. I was about to say, let's just forget me. Let's just pray the rest of the time and then go watch the Cowboys lose or whatever you guys want to do. Like, like come on. I'm just kidding. I don't care at all what happens in this game. Um, but yeah, my name is Jake Tracy. Uh, we're going to have a good time this morning. Um, and I told Angel back there wearing the 49ers gear, I said, I'll keep it short and sweet. We'll get you your nap before your game and, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be good to go. Um, really quick, we're going to be in Acts chapter 15, by the way, if you guys want to get ready there. But I do want to kind of just reiterate this course, this, uh, you know, Pathways to Discipleship course that we're going to be starting. Anytime I do announcements or host or whatever, you know I harp on Bible studies, right? I'm, and then I wasn't there last week. But I always harp on Bible studies. It's like, we, this is important. We got to be there. We got to do these things. We got to open the word together. This is important stuff. This is also very important because it's going to help us understand what we're reading. Is the Bible hard to read for anybody else? It's difficult. You read things and you're like, what the heck? Or you're having a conversation and someone says, yeah, but the Bible hates women. And you're like, no, it does it say that in there, you know, right? These are things that you want to discover. You want to look into, well, what is actually going on here? This book is going to help us do that. Um, it gives us a, a beautiful foundation for us to be able to approach the scriptures properly. And when we approach the scriptures properly, we can understand God's character better. And when we understand God's character better, you can understand, one, the role that you play within this story, but you can also understand your identity through Christ and through God. Does that make sense? So it's important. It's very important. I encourage you, if you can, please, please make it. I saw the sign-up list, and it seems like there's a good amount of people going. So it's going to be fun. We're going to have a good time. Um, we are going to be in Acts chapter 15 as we continue on the journey through Acts. We're going to finish it. So I will, I'll pray, and we'll, we'll get started here. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity. God, we thank you that we can be here. We thank you for your word. And we ask this morning that this word would not just be you know, a, a presentation that's for no use, but God, this would be a time where we get to lean into what you are trying to communicate this morning. So I pray that our hearts be open. I pray that our eyes and ears be open, that we can see and hear the things that you want for us this morning and from us this morning. And so Lord, we give it to you, and it's in Jesus' name we all said, amen. amen. Well, let's do it. We're going to be Acts chapter 15. The, the theme of this is going to be disagreement, okay? It's going to be disagreement. Um, some commentators will call Acts chapter 15 the dispute, right? It's the dispute. And we'll, we'll talk about why, because there's some big implications that are, that are involved with what we're going to read. But here we go. We're going to be verse 1. It says this, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. And they said, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses... You cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the other, others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. And, brought, and it brought great joy to all the brothers. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and order them to keep the law of Moses. If you were like me, you're kind of a... Uh, I wouldn't say, okay, yeah, if you're like me, you're kind of a worst case scenario thinker. Anybody else? Okay, yeah, my, or you could say, if you don't want to sound bad, you could say like, I'm more analytical and critical, right? Because, and I'll give you an example of what I mean. So when my wife told us, told me, 
that she was pregnant with our second son, I was like, oh, great, <laughs> you know? Like, I'm excited. This is fun. If I'm honest, my first thought was like, okay, is our insurance going to go up? Right? Like, okay, and then he's got, where is he going to sleep? We got to figure that out. My car seat isn't going to fit. That's for the bigger boy. That's not going to fit. Right? My brain goes to the, anybody else do this? You think about all the things that are involved with something, right? Whereas normal people that aren't like me are like, this is great. This is so exciting. Let's celebrate, and then we'll figure it out later, you know? Yes, see? Like, yes, and there, there are people like that, and I envy that, because I'm like, I wish I was just only excited all the time. But my brain is like, no, hold on. There's a lot of things involved here, and we need to figure it out. But here's the question. Are the concerns I have valid? Of course they're valid, right? Like, yeah, we do have to address these things at some point, right? We have, at some point, we're going to have to figure out where he's going to sleep. At some point, we're going to have to figure out if we need to get another car seat, right? At some point, i got to figure out the insurance situation. Did it have to happen that moment? No. Of course not. And it didn't. Only in my head it happened, just so you guys know. I was like, I was excited outside, but inside I was like... I was like, okay, I'm going to lean on the Lord on this one here. But no, very excited. And he's actually going to be here very shortly, and I cannot wait. Yes, he's going to wait. The end of March. So we, we're, what are we, nine weeks away now? So I'm excited, and we know where he's going to sleep. Um, <laughs> but it kind of feels like this is a bit of what's happening here. Um, right? The Gentiles are, Gentiles being just non Jews, are starting to believe in God, right? They're converting. And they're talking, they're sharing these stories about, look what God has done in all of these people. Like, look, and, and the Holy Spirit's moving. Mind you, we're not far off after the death and resurrection of Jesus. We're still kind of in the vicinity there. And they're like, man, the Holy Spirit is doing all these amazing things, and people are coming to God, and, and it's amazing, and it's fun, and we're celebrating. And quickly, right off the bat, the Pharisees go, they need to be circumcised. They need to keep the law of Moses. And you're like... Dude, okay, yeah, we'll get there, but can we just have a moment? Like, look at all the things that God is doing. Look at all the things that God is doing. And so they say, it is necessary for them to be, the Gentiles, to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses if they want to be saved. So it seems that the Pharisees are adding what, I guess, yeah, the Pharisees are adding what seems to be stipulations to salvation, right? And this is where the debate is going to begin. The Pharisees have one way of how it ought to be, and we're going to look at what Peter, James, uh, and, and, and Paul, and Barnabas, and what they all have to say. We'll see what the apostles have to say. Verse 6, the debate begins. Well, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and there had been much debate. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Here we go. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Okay. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. Verse 11, here we go, here's the kicker. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ just as they will. Do we see the two sides here? Okay. And so here are the two sides, if, just so we are all on the same page here. The Pharisees are saying, no, they need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. they got to do the law. you got to keep the law if you want to be saved. And then the Peter and the other apostles are saying, no, we believe that you are saved by grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. Now, mind you, throughout this time we have right now, I'm going to cut a little bit of slack to the Pharisees because they didn't have books like, you know, Romans or Hebrews to check back in on and be like, okay, hold on, let's figure out what we're supposed to do. They didn't have this, right? They're kind of, you know, putting the plane together while they're in the air. You know what I mean? You guys follow me? So you kind of give a little bit of grace there. You're like, okay, you're just trying to figure it out a little bit. It's not necessarily like you are in opposition. 
You just don't know. It's new. Okay? And so that's, that's a bit of what's happening. So, with that said, Jesus, in Luke chapter 5, he kind of gave us a, like a warning, or he, he, he basically said this was going to happen. And I'll read it to you, and then we'll talk about why this is this. But it's in Luke chapter 5, it's a parable of the wineskins. Anybody familiar with this parable? Okay, so a parable is just a, a story that Jesus used to teach to prove a spiritual point. And he says this. Uh, Jesus says, no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Because if he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Because if he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But the new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. Okay, this is what we're seeing right now. And I'll explain to you. Here we go. You have the Pharisees, the party of the Pharisees, who are pushing for what we're going to call legalism. You got to keep the law. You got to do the things right. If you can do all the things right, you can have salvation. You can have relationship with God. If you keep the law. And again, I'm going to give them some grace here. This was how it was. This was how they related to God for a long time. It was, yeah, you got to obey the law of Moses. you got to offer the sacrifices. This is kind of how it was. And so they're saying, you know, this is how we've always done it. We're just going to continue to do it this way. But that's an old way of doing it. That was the old, that was before Jesus. And in all honesty, there's some, and I'm not going to say all, but there are some, you know, sects of Christian that of Christianity that kind of believe similar in a sense of maybe they believe that you have to be baptized in order for salvation or you have to keep certain sacraments in order to be saved as a requirement for salvation now I don't believe that okay and I have reasons and I can share one of them me and Dylan were actually talking about this the other day but then you would go do you remember when Jesus was on the cross and the thief on the cross he says oh my he comes to a realization he goes oh wait you really are him. And Jesus says, today you will join me in paradise. Did that guy keep the law? No. Was he baptized? Odds are no. We can speculate, probably not. But was he gifted salvation? By who? Okay. So that's where I go. Okay, so it isn't necessary. It isn't a requirement for salvation. Was Jesus baptized? Should we be baptized? Okay, so we're all on the same page here. Okay, but I don't believe that it's required. And that's kind of what's happening. The Pharisees are saying, no, this is required if you want to have a relationship with God. If you don't do these things, you can't. It's not going to work. It's not going to happen. Can you imagine, can you imagine if we use this same logic or the same principle in like, a, like your, your personal relationships? Right? Like it, in your marriage, imagine if your spouse only loved and accepted you if you did everything right. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Some husbands are like, see, I told you I can't do it. <laughs> like, I told you, I've been telling you this for years. You know? Um, but it wouldn't work. Imagine you only could get, lo- you'd only receive the love, you'd only receive acceptance, you'd only receive relationship if you did everything right. It would never work. Or what if, what if, um, like a child to a parent. What if a, a parent could only accept the child if the child did everything right all the time? Would that work? Of course not. Why? Because the child can't do everything right all the time. It's impossible. It'll never work. Therefore, you will never have a relationship with that child. You'll never have a relationship with your spouse. You'll, you won't be able to. You'll never be able to attain it. And then you'd wake up in the morning, you'd wake up every day and say, man, I don't know where I stand with them. Where are we at today? Are we good today? Are we not good today? Was I good enough yesterday so that way we can be, you know, we can have a good day today? It doesn't work. This logic doesn't work. And if I'm honest, we kind of do this with God, do we not? Of course we do. 
That's why I was laughing when we were talking, even Phil was talking about it too. We've been talking about this idea of like, man, sometimes we feel like we just have to have it all together to approach God. And we feel like, man, I, 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 maybe it's like I would go to those Bible studies, but I, I had a rough week. Like, I'm not going this week. God doesn't want me there this week. Right? Or maybe you did something at night and you're like, man, I shouldn't have done that. And then in the morning is your, you know, your usual like, time you might spend with God or read scriptures. And you go, God, I can't open the Bible today. <laughs> There's no way I'm worthy of opening that Bible today. Anybody else ever felt this way before? Like, not today. I'm, I'm not praying tonight, that's for sure. Right? After what we did, I'm not praying. I'm not praying. So there's no way I can come to God with this one. Of course we do this. And I want to make the argument here is that this is not a burden that God created. This is a, this is a burden that our human nature created because we feel like we don't deserve acceptance from God. Because we feel like maybe we aren't good enough. And I don't have time to get into that, but it's kind of true. But we do this with God. Now, that's how the Pharisees are viewing this. They're saying, you got to do everything, get it right, then you can have salvation. Okay. And that's the old wine. So now we have Jesus. And we have what, the, what Peter and James and the apostles are teaching. They're saying, no, salvation by grace. Jesus is the new wine. Jesus brought a new covenant, a new way of doing things. He brought a new way for us to approach God, that you and I can now have a relationship with God, whereas before we couldn't unless we did everything right. Do you see why this is not going to fit in the old way of thinking? It's not going to work. And so what we're seeing here is the Pharisees didn't have an understanding of the relationship between law and grace. They didn't understand the relationship between law and grace. And we're going to talk about it a little bit later. But that's kind of what's happening here. Now, I believe we're saved by grace. Yes. But I do want to give a disclaimer. Is that that doesn't mean, you know, what do they call it? The license to sin, right? That doesn't mean that. I, I do also firmly believe that we should go hard against sin. And I believe that we should hate what is evil, just like they teach in Romans, right? We should hate what is evil. We should cling to what is good. I believe that. However, if you're like me, when the inevitable happens, we want to switch our thinking from I can't approach God to what Hebrew says, and that's no, in fact, when the inevitable mistakes happen, I can approach God with confidence. I can approach grace with confidence, knowing that I'm accepted in this moment. Even though I don't feel, even though I'm not even accepting myself in this moment, I know that I can approach God and God is accepting me and he loves me. You follow me? So now, we're going to kind of bounce around here for a second, but oh my gosh, did I really go this long already? Okay. Um, The point that we need to make here is this. Here's the point. The Pharisees need to understand this point. We need to understand this point. We believe that we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Amen? Amen. Beautiful. Okay, grace by faith wins. Now, we're going to move on to our second portion of this. And just to kind of give you a quick paraphrase of verses 12 through 18, uh, Paul, Barnabas, and James, they're telling stories, and you know, they're still kind of debating, and they're, they're, they're speaking stories of the prophets, and they're saying, here's why our point is right, okay? Verse 19 is kind of a conclusion. It says this, Therefore, this is James, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled, and from blood. How many of you guys don't understand the what has been strangled and blood thing? But if you read how not to read the Bible, (laughs) this might make some more sense to you. I'll leave it at that. You can sign up at the Connect booth. Okay. (laughs) Verse 21. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Okay. We're going to stay right here. Verse 19 and 20. I'm going to read it again. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Fair enough? 
but we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. We should not trouble them, but. Okay? We should not trouble them, but. James right now is carefully making the distinction between two important things. One of them is salvation. The other one is what's called sanctification. Okay? Now, I'll define these for you. Salvation, we believe, is grace from Jesus alone. When you put your faith into Christ, you repent of your sins, you are saved. Salvation, you are part of the team, you're in the club. Okay? Now, sanctification is the process or the path of righteousness. Okay? So it's the path that basically you and I are going to live for the rest of our lives as we walk closer to God. It's this idea of walking closer to God. The actual definition would be to be made holy. Being made holy as an ongoing, almost a verb, really. Being made holy. So, just because you've accepted the Lord, yep, you're saved. Now we begin the process of sanctification. So let me illustrate it kind of like this. Let's say God is over here, okay? You and I, at some point in our life, we're walking this way, yes? Walking away from God. And then there's a moment where God, however it looks for you, God caught your attention. You've, you, know, you put your faith in him. You believed in him. You've repented of your sins. By repent, this is repentance. Okay? No longer are you wanting to walk that way. Now you walk this way. And the process of walking this way is called sanctification. And for the rest of your life, you're going to live this process out. You're going to be being made holy until the final day when you're in heaven with God himself when that's perfected. But until then, you and I live the life, the process of sanctification. Does that make sense? So, we believe when you were here, God saved you. You're in. But he's, James says, however, we should write to them and show them the path of righteousness. Show them how to walk. Show them what to do. Are they saved? Yes. We're not going to trouble them about their salvation. We're saved. But let's show them how to walk this way. Let's show them how to walk this way. A.W. Tozer says, All things as they move toward God are beautiful, and they are ugly as they move away from him. You know, we have this, um, we have an iPad at home, and <laughs> it's like, a lot of people, there's a lot you can do with an iPad, right? There's, you can do a million different things with it. What we do with it is, you know when, you know, the baby's little and you have to have, like, a baby monitor? Our iPad is just a baby monitor. That's all it is. We just set it up. We turn it on. We turn on the little camera thing. I set it up right next to my bed, our, our bed, and I uh, plug the charger in, turn the brightness down, and I go to sleep. Would anybody say that maybe we're underutilizing the iPad? Right? You're like, dude, you could read books, you could create a budget, like you could do whatever you want on this thing, and you're only using it when you sleep. Like you're completely wasting the potential of this iPad. There's so much you could do with it. And I think sometimes we do this with God. And what I don't want us to do is this. I don't want us to, as God calls us here, into salvation, to be simply okay with just this. Okay? Right? Where some, uh, I mean, this happens all the time, in, in especially the West. But it's like, we're okay. We're, I'm saved. I'm good. I'm fine. We're good. And then, you know, we kind of just kick it here until we die, and then we use our ticket to heaven and move on, right? But what God is doing, he's not calling us to that. He's not calling us to be satisfied simply with salvation. God is calling us into a lifelong process of walking towards him. What I don't want us to do is be okay simply staying here. I want us as a church and as individuals to learn to embrace the walk all the way back to God, even though you walked real far away at times. I want us to embrace the fact that we get to walk towards God and that as we walk towards God, that's exactly that. We become closer to God. This makes sense so far. This is what's called sanctification. And I think a lot of us, I mean, I can even say it for myself, is like, 
Many of us have been saved for years. We've been in the church for years. And you go, I feel stuck. I just feel stuck. I feel like I've been in the same spot for a long time. And you have to ask why. Now, we don't believe that you work your way to salvation. But we do believe that salvation should cause you to work your way to Christ. And I don't mean to salvation. I mean just to getting closer to growing in relationship with Christ. Your salvation is to be the beginning. And just like James says, he says, look, yes, don't trouble them for their salvation. You're saved. You're okay. They're good. But teach them how to walk. And we're all going to find this, by the way, as a theme in really in this 2023 is this idea of discipleship. We want to make sure that we're doing our part and making it easy for people to understand and grasp and know the ways to, do, to walk and know how to do this thing. Because as a church, we, it, it's on us if we create a church that just stays here for years and years and years and years. And at some point, guess what? Myself, Dylan, all that are involved have to answer to God and say, what, what happened there? You had a church full of people that didn't do anything with their faith. I take that serious because I believe that that's part on me. And so what we want to do is create a church that says, you're good, you're saved, you are so loved, you're loved more than you could ever understand, but here's also what we're going to do. But we're also going to keep walking this way. You guys are going to love me because I'm about to wrap this up right now. Um, No offense, Dylan, but... uh, I said no offense. (laughs) That means no offense. Stop laughing at him. That's going to offend him. Okay, here we go. I'm just kidding. I love you so much. Also, really quick before I close this out, Dylan said that he's never, ever preached with a beanie on. I firmly believe that's a lie. Now, it's not here nor there, but I think that's a little fishy. Anyways, moving on. (laughs) I'm going to check back in our records and our photos and see if I can find one. And if I do, it will be on that screen next week. Um, so here, as we wrap this up, here's, here's kind of what I want to illustrate one more time as we... This is kind of like, and Dylan uses gym analogies a lot too, right? But it's so, it's so fitting when it comes to the faith. It's so fitting because the gym was kind of like this for me. I don't go often. But, but there was a time where I was going. And, uh, you know, and, but before you go, it's like it's an intimidating thing to do because you got people there that have been there for a long time and they like are all jacked, right? Or people that have lost, you know, 100 pounds and you're like, man, these guys have been doing this thing and they're good at it. And I don't know forms. I don't know what machines do. What. Like, I don't know how to do this. But these guys are good at it and it's kind of hard and it's intimidating. But they're good at it because they've been doing it for a while, right? They've been doing it. They've been going. They've been dis- disciplined in doing that. But the question I want to ask is this, who is able to own a gym membership? Anybody. Anybody can have a gym membership. If you want one and you just pay whatever it is, I paid nine bucks a month. If you want one, you can have one. You're in the club. You will have access to that gym. You can go to that gym whenever you want. And if you're like me, you pay for it and you don't use it. Right? Right? Most of us, I say not most of us, but a lot of us do this, right? This is kind of the ongoing thing. But the gym is only good if you go to the gym, and it's only good if you lift the weights. It only works if you really lift the weights. It only works if you really, you know, get on that treadmill or whatever it is, and you actually do the things. You got to do the things to see the fruit, to see the results. Does this make sense so far? But who could go to the gym? Anybody. Anybody. In the same way, anybody that so chooses to come to Christ can come to Christ. Anybody that decides to stop, repent, and look this way can come to Christ. They're saved. I believe that. I believe that wholeheartedly. They are saved. But if you want to see fruit, if you want to see results, you got to walk this way. This isn't necessarily, and I'm not... I'm not undermining the importance and power of salvation by any stretch of the imagination, but I am saying this is good, but this is the beginning. And God wants so much more for you today, tomorrow, and the next day, and he doesn't want to only be this, like, free ticket to heaven. 
God wants to do things in your life today, tomorrow, and the next day. God's like, yeah, you're saved, but you know what? There's habits. I want to break these habits in your life. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to heal these areas of your life. I want to restore these, these relationships. I want to restore this marriage. I want to do these things. I want, I want you to just, come on, come walk with me. Before you know it, you're over here. And you've seen these habits go, and you've seen these relationships restored, and you're like, God, me following you, you look at all this that you've done in my life. And this is why we don't ever want to stay, simply stay here. We want to start here and live a life of sanctification where God brings us into holiness, brings us into lives of righteousness. Verse 28 says, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden, this is them writing the letter, than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. You'll do well. Will these things by themselves save you? No. Are they good for you? Yeah. They are. Do you guys see the distinction between good works and grace? Grace, salvation and grace are, they precede good works. We are to produce good works. We are to abstain from what is evil. But you, some of of us in here need to understand that you're okay though, you're saved. You are loved. You're accepted today. Jesus loves you more right now than he ever has before. And that statement will always be true anytime you say it. And so let's settle the dispute here. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ, done deal, but now you live a life on the path of righteousness. Paul says it, he sums it up very well in Ephesians. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now I want to take this one step further and then I'm done, I promise. I want to kind of expound on this this gym thing because I thought about it like, you know, um, you kind of have to think of God like, what are they called? Like a spotter, right? Or like a trainer at the gym. Someone who's like kind of walking alongside you, right? And so you go to the gym and and you see the guy, like, you know, you're uh, bench pressing or whatever. And there's a guy that's like right there holding the bar, just making sure it doesn't fall. Making sure that thing doesn't fall. Sometimes we view God like, hey, this weight is heavy and I've dropped it on my chest. And you look at God and you think he's going and he's slamming it down even further saying, don't talk to me until you can lift that weight. Don't talk to me until you got this. But God is more like the spotter or the trainer saying, I understand you don't have it quite yet. I got you. Let's let's pick it back up. Let's rack it. And we're going to try it again. And then you try it again and it drops and God doesn't go, dude, you got to get this. He's like, no, pick it up, let's go. Come on, keep going. I'm not going anywhere, I'm still here. And before you know it, you've added so much weight to that bar and you're like, how on earth am I lifting this much weight? Because you spent so much time with God as God is partnering with God that you were once here and God all the way, before you know it, brought you all the way over here because you kept going. Because you did abstain from those things that were evil. You did abstain from the sexual immorality, right? You did do the things. And now you got to see the fruit of what God is doing in your life. My point is, you are saved by grace, but God has so much more for you than simply salvation. He's got so much more for you than simply you waiting to die. He's got so much more for you today. And I believe that this morning, he is calling you to say, no, 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 it's time for you to approach me. You spend too long thinking you can't approach me. You spend too long thinking you don't have it right. You spend too long with an incorrect view of who I am. And today, I need you to come to me because I got something for you. I got a plan for your life. I'm going to take you somewhere. And we're going to walk the process of sanctification. And I'm going to bring you from A to B if you so choose to partner with me. Does that make sense? 
Today's the day that God 